You are listening to The Evidence Locker. We would like to wish our listeners an awesome 2019. Thank you for supporting our podcast in 2018. We are looking forward to bringing you more true crime stories from all around the world in the new year. Thanks again. And keep those messages coming. We read all of them. And we try our best to reply to everyone. We hope you enjoy today's episode. Our cases have been researched using open source and archive materials. It deals with true crimes and real people. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. Boaz Clemenson of Narsac, a town in Greenland, was enjoying New Year's Eve of 1989, going into 1990. He was celebrating at home with his wife, Cecilia, and their two grown sons, Christian and Abel. The four of them had dinner together, followed by sampling some of Boaz's homemade beer. Boaz knew his sons were eager to go out and party with their friends, so he didn't keep them. Christian went to his home, a housing complex in town. Abel went to meet up with some friends. Both promised to be home before midnight. Boaz and Cecilia watched TV and kept an eye on the clock. As promised, Christian and Abel were home around 10 minutes before midnight. Excited to call in the new year, the family lit candles in the house, all the candles they could find. Then they went into the snow outside to enjoy the neighborhood fireworks. Abel found a big rocket somewhere and proudly fired it up. For Boaz, the party was only getting started. He poured champagne for everybody, his family, friends, and neighbors. He was a bit tipsy and his youngest son Abel was amused by his silliness. Shortly before 1 a.m., Abel's friend Enoch dropped by. After joking around and singing songs about being happy, the youngsters started making tracks. Boaz was touched by his son's positive attitude and wiped away the tears of gratitude. Christian, Abel, and Enoch said goodbye and left to go to Christian's. A drunken Boaz went to sleep at 3 a.m., looking forward to 1990, but that was not destined to be a happy year after all. As he stood in the kitchen at 11 a.m., drinking his first coffee of the new year, he saw two police officers walking towards his home. They seemed uncomfortable and awkward. He frowned as he opened the door, and they asked him where his youngest son, Little Label, was. Boaz had no idea why they were looking for him. What did Abel Clemenson do in the early morning hours of January 1st, 1990? Greenland is the largest island on Earth, as well as the least populated area on the planet. It has a population of just over 56,000 people. Three quarters of the island of Greenland is covered by a permanent sheet of ice. Ironically, Iceland is greener than Greenland, and Greenland has more ice than Iceland. But a name swap is probably not on the cards anytime soon. Even though geographically it is located closer to North America, It has associated with Europe for more than a thousand years. Although it governs itself, it is still a part of the Danish realm. It controls its own monetary policy and even hosted the 2016 Arctic Winter Games. 80% of the population have roots in the indigenous Inuit culture. Much of the population lives from fishing and hunting seal. The fishing export industry is the pulse of Greenland's economy. Inuit had no choice but to embrace modernization, and today they work for wages to earn income for electricity, running water, and other modern comforts. Hunting is still very much a part of their culture, however, so firearms and weapons are widespread all over the country. Narsak is a town located on the southern tip of the icy island, about 250 miles, that's just over 400 kilometers, 
from the capital city of Nuuk. As towns and villages are mostly not connected by roads, the best way to get there is by boat. The name Narsak translates to plain. It is a town that was built on a flat clearing, next to the water's edge in Teniliarfic Fjord. The surrounding area is mountainous, with many fjords cutting deep into the land, making for breathtakingly beautiful scenery. The town of Narsak is dotted with wooden buildings painted in bright colors, yellow, blue, green, and red. Some are small two-bedroom cottages. Others are larger halls or multi-room buildings. Icebergs float in the distance, and the jagged cliffs of the mountains keep vigil over its inhabitants. It's a peaceful place with a strong sense of community. Home to 2,000 people, mostly of Inuit ethnicity, Narsak is one of the more sizable towns in Greenland. There is a small police station, a fire station, some education facilities, a two-story 14-bed hospital, and one hotel. Although it had been a settlement for centuries, Narsak was only established as a trading colony in the 19th century, as its natural harbor allowed large ships to cruise deeper into the land's interior and dock easily. It was a thriving fishing village in the early 20th century, and population boomed in the 1950s when a prawn and fishing factory was built. Unfortunately, Greenland is a country with many social problems, and Narsak is not immune to them. Not only does Greenland have one of the highest suicide rates in the world, it also is one of the countries where the most rapes occur. The murder rate is also very high. The year before the Narsak massacre took place, there were 18 homicides in Greenland in a 12-month period. Bear in mind that the population was only 55,000 at the time. That means a homicide rate of 33 murders per 100,000 people, which is high considering that the average homicide rate in the U.S. is less than 5 murders per 100,000 people. The smaller villages are more prevalent to rape incidents, as it is difficult for victims to report it. Not every village has a police station, so cases need to be reported to the closest town and accessibility is problematic. Police rarely follow up as they do not tend to go to the smaller villages. Even if a rape is reported, it takes a long time before the perpetrator is even charged. People living in villages also all know each other, and accusing someone of rape can make a victim's life very difficult and uncomfortable. They all shop at the same grocery store, they go to the same restaurants, and they have the same circle of friends. Besides, the maximum penalty for rape is only 12 to 18 months in prison so some victims feel it's not even worth the stress of reporting it. Many people blame the rapid onset of modernization for social problems. Sociologist Christina Viscom litgen larsen from the National Institute for Public Health in Denmark feels that the changes happen very rapidly. Many have been forced to give up being hunters and fishermen to forge a new life in modern society, which has created massive problems, including alcohol abuse and sexual assault. The potent cocktail of alcoholism and violence leads to suicide. Growing up and living in an environment where abuse is seen as normal, it probably is no surprise that the suicide rate is so high. Interestingly, most suicides do not occur in the long and dark winters, but rather in the summer when it's only dark for a couple of hours a day. Chronic insomnia has also been considered as a contributing factor to suicides in Greenland. Then there is the high crime rate. Perhaps one should consider how they deal with criminals. In Greenland, there are no closed prisons. Murderers, rapists, and other offenders still remain a part of society until they are transported to Denmark and have been processed through the Danish legal system. They are held at a prison-like facility but they are only required to be there from 9.30 at night until 6 o'clock in the morning. Some inmates even have keys to their cells for their own privacy. Granted, the privilege of freedom is earned after some time. Each prisoner is evaluated based on the crime he or she committed and the behavior while incarcerated. Torben Thru, head of the correctional institution in Nuuk, made a statement that explains it somewhat. During the reindeer season, we take the convicts out hunting, even the murderers. 
Obviously, we don't take the mentally unstable. They get to go fishing. The notion of open prisons would seem outlandish to most civilizations. But living in one of the world's harshest environments means that every member of the community is needed to survive, even criminals. The director of a commission that was established to review the judicial system in Greenland claims, Murderers and rapists will still live among us. It might be an unusual system, but the criminals in society accept it. It was only as a Danish colony that a police force and lay judicial system was implemented. But as Greenland is autonomous, law is still practiced differently than in Denmark. Mille Peterson, a lay magistrate at the High Court in Nuuk, said, We don't believe in punishment. We achieve more by trying to re-socialize people. Locking someone up for 10 years isn't going to make them a better person. Convicts have to pay the correctional facility 735 Danish krona, about 100 US dollars, a week for their board and counseling is compulsory. They are also required to send money to their family. So to ensure an income, they are required to work when they leave prison every day. In a town like Narsak, minor offenses are rarely reported to police and some people get away with the lot. Like 18-year-old petty criminal Abel Clemenson. By his own admission, he had committed some crimes, but nothing serious. He has been caught drinking on the street, and he was guilty of vandalism. Abel later said that there isn't much to do in Narsag, so they smoked weed and drank and got into altercations. This is what they did for entertainment. Most parents drank heavily, and Abel's dad, Boaz, was no exception. Abel avoided bringing friends home, as his parents often quarreled, mainly about his father's drinking. Abel was the youngest of seven children, and he was always quietly his mother's favorite. She showered him with attention, and he usually got his way. Being part of a big family, Abel was always seen as the baby. Even as an 18-year-old young man, people referred to him as Little Abel. That was also in part because he bore the same name as his maternal grandfather, Big Abel, a larger-than-life character who lived in a village nearby. His parents moved to Narsak in 1969, a couple of years before Abel was born. During this time, Danish influence in Greenland was strong. Native Inuit communities had to start learning Danish at school and adapt to Danish customs. In Abel's home, they only spoke Greenlandic, he was very Greenlandic in his way of thinking and did not like Danish teachers at school, which often led to conflict. Overall, he wasn't a very strong student. There was a sense that he didn't quite get what he was learning. But he was headstrong, and seeing as he was used to calling the shots at home, he assumed he could do it at school as well. But that didn't really go down. When he was in the fourth grade, Abel and some other boys had constant friction. They all went for counseling, and were placed in separate classes for a while. Abel's friends would get tired of him because he always wanted to have things done his way. He would break pencils when he acted out as he found it hard to formulate his feelings. As Abel got older, his shyness got the better of him. At social gatherings, he wouldn't dance or socialize like the other teenagers. He would cower in a corner or hang around outside. Because of his social awkwardness, he hung out with his older brother, Christian, a lot. Christian did not live at home anymore. He had a room at Ungbo, a housing complex for single young workers in the town of Narsak. Christian was more sociable and didn't mind his little brother tagging along. Abel did have a couple of friends, though. There was one guy that took Abel under his wing. For legal reasons, his name cannot be made public, but we'll refer to him as T. Abel idolized T. In many respects, he was everything Abel was not. He was gifted and outgoing. People commented on the fact that he was eloquent and could speak Danish fluently. Even though all kids learned Danish at school, at the end of his school career, Abel could hardly string two Danish words together. On New Year's Eve, December 31st, 1989, Abel ushered in the New Year with his family and neighbors. Just after midnight, his brother Christian fired an emergency flare, as is custom in Greenland on New Year's Eve, and everyone cheered. Then the two brothers went to Ungbo, where residents were having a New Year's Eve party. 
With a little imagination, one can think that there was a radio in one corner blaring with music by Madonna, Milli Vanilli, Roxette, perhaps Alice Cooper's Poison even played. When the brothers arrived, Abel ran into his friend, T. Earlier that day, Abel had had a disagreement with a female friend. T heard about this and was furious. He felt that Abel was way out of line. When he saw Abel at Ungbo, he told him so. The friends argued, and at one point, T pinned Abel up against the wall. He said that he did not want to be his friend anymore. In fact, he never wanted to see him again. T left the party, and Abel was deeply hurt. He felt alone and abandoned. He would be nothing without T. He felt that the end of their friendship was the end of the road for him. And in the heat of the moment, Abel decided the only solution was to end his own life. He would kill himself in front of everyone at the party. That would be the only way that he could get back at T for ending their friendship. Abel left Umbo in a rage. Christian and his friends assumed that they wouldn't see him again, that Abel had called it a night. But if only that were true. In the early morning hours of January 1st, 1990, Abel Clemenson marched home to the house where he lived with his parents. He fetched a semi-automatic rifle, which he kept in his room and filled the magazines with ammunition. Then he went straight back to Ungbo. When he returned, he went upstairs to room number six on the first floor, where the party was still buzzing. The door was open, and he could see his brother, Christian Clemenson, standing in the doorway. There were some more young people in the room behind him, drinking, laughing, partying. Christian saw his brother's face and realized that something was not right. Abel had completely changed. He looked like he was possessed. Before Christian could do anything, Abel lifted the gun, fired the first shot, aimed at his own brother's head. The bullet hit Christian in the face, and he immediately dropped to the floor. There was chaos as the other partygoers looked on with shock and horror. Abel could not hear anything. He felt like he was floating on a cloud. Mechanically, he carried on his rampage, pulled the trigger again and again, and fired randomly into the room. On the first floor, spread over two rooms, he shot three women and four men. When he was done, Abel simply turned around and walked downstairs, not even looking back at the carnage. As he reached the downstairs lounge, he saw another woman whom he didn't know, and without hesitation, he shot her too. All up, Abel Clemenson had fired 11 rounds. He had planned to end the shooting by killing himself, but he could not go through with it. He didn't have the strength. Once he was outside Ungbo, On the street, he could hear again. He knew he had done something terrible, and he fell to the ground. After a while, he dragged himself upright and walked home in the blistering weather. Once he returned, he went straight to sleep. At the scene in Ungbo, five young people lay dead. Two young women were seriously injured with gunshot wounds to their heads. There was only one victim who was still conscious. It was the gunman's brother, 22-year-old Christian Clemenson. The only reason he survived was because he remained on the floor and pretended to be dead. When Abel was gone, he managed to get up and run to the local hospital. Hospital staff informed police of the situation. One of the nurses on duty heard what Christian said and realized that her son had said that he was going to Ungbo that night. Sadly, it turned out that her son was one of the victims who was slaughtered on that very night. At 11 a.m. on New Year's Day, 1990, Abel Clemenson was arrested at his parents' home. He confessed to the murders and said that he was inebriated when it all happened. He was detained while law enforcement waited for support to arrive from Denmark. Due to heavy snowfall, Danish investigators were delayed. All the while, The scene inside the housing complex remained untouched. Remnants of a party gone horrifically wrong haunted the villagers who tried to make sense of what had happened. 
There was hope that the two female victims in hospital could be saved, but they would need specialized care. Plans were made to transfer them to Denmark, but then the weather came in and no one was able to travel to or from Narsak. In the end, the two young females died at the hospital, making Christian the sole survivor of the attack. The seven victims ranged in age between 18 and 34. The small community of Narsak had lost three young men, Jakob Gronvold, Egede Tittesen, and Henrik Barnabasen. The female victims were Catherine Broberg, Tove Isaacson, Parnanguak Godfredson, and Bibian Christiansen. In the days following the shooting, police prohibited the use of semi-automatic rifles and restricted alcohol sales. After forensic testing on the victims, their bodies were taken to the local gym hall. Families of the victims wanted to see them, to be with them. Police officers and the resident priests facilitated the viewings. Each family had 30 minutes to say their goodbyes before the bodies were taken to be prepared for the funeral. The whole town attended the mass funeral. To accommodate everyone, the memorial service was held in the gym hall. All seven caskets were lined up next to each other at the front of the hall. Abel and Christian's parents and their other children also attended the funeral. They had flowers which they placed on each casket. On that day, the community of Narsag did not ostracize them. After the funeral, however, some villagers were understandably upset and protested in front of Boaz and Cecilia's house. They had their curtains drawn for a long time as they dealt with the guilt and shame of their son's actions. Ironically, the most supportive members of the community were the families of the victims. They felt sorry for the Clemensons. Nobody would have ever thought that little Abel would be capable of committing such a heinous crime. In a way, Boaz and Cecilia also lost their son that day. In March 1991, Abel Clemenson was sentenced to indefinite detention at a psychiatric institution in Hersted Vester, Denmark. He was diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. This means that he would not be able to take criticism or rejection. The fact that T had ended the friendship with Abel left him feeling humiliated. The only way to boost his own self-importance would have been a grandiose act, like killing himself in front of a crowd. Unfortunately, he decided to kill the crowd instead. In December 2015, Abel was granted weekend release. That means he can leave the psychiatric facility. But as his home isn't in Denmark, he is placed in a government-sponsored apartment in a rural area. Many people have spoken up against the fact that serious offenders from Greenland are obliged to serve their sentences in Denmark. Most of them, like Abel, cannot speak Danish and they are treated as second-rate prisoners. The punishment is contrary to Inuit tradition, and people in Greenland feel their offenders should be serving time in their home country. That would mean open prisons and a lot more freedom. But the question remains. If all prisoners were made to face harsher consequences for their actions, would Greenland's crime statistics perhaps look better? Or would it be wiser to consider what is at the root of the problem? Abel Clemenson's dad, Boaz, is a simple man, but he is a proud Greenlander with roots steeped in Inuit tradition. The challenges of modernization and cultural displacement have not gone past him. When asked why young men in Greenland resort to violence so often, he answered pensively, The change has taken place too fast. We could not follow. We cannot teach our sons to become men. It's not the joy of being young like when we were young. We went hunting and fishing. Today, there is not much to catch. There is unemployment and economic crisis. There is no reason to get up in the morning. It is very difficult for us as parents to look at. On New Year's Day 1992, two years after the massacre, a ceremony was held at the Narsak Cemetery. A big memorial was unveiled that had all of the victims' names and their ages. It's a small comfort knowing that the victims will not be forgotten, although no one in town wants to remember what people refer to as the episode. The incident 
that scarred the scenic town of Narsak forever. If you'd like to read more about this case, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. Also, visit and like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash evidence locker podcast to see more about today's case. If you like our podcast, please subscribe in Apple Podcast or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. We would also appreciate if you could review the episodes as it gives us some street cred in the world of podcasting. This was The Evidence Locker. Thank you for listening.